Please welcome back to the Alpha stage, the Chief Executive Officer of Alpha, Mr. Charlie Garcia. Hello, everyone. Hello, Alpha. Today we uh, start something that we started last year, which is to invite chief executive officers to come talk to Alpha so that we can all learn valuable leadership lessons. But this CEO is so special that I decided we should bring him to you all by himself. He's the only Latino CEO who's run three $50 billion market cap companies in three continents, U.S. West in the U.S., in France, Orange, which is now France Telecom, and all the way to Australia to take over Telstra. And before the iPhone came out, you had a very similar smartphone with more functionality at Telstra that this individual, one of the most innovative CEOs on the planet, happens to also be Latino. And his name is Sol Trujillo, and I want you to watch this short uh, video. Well, it's interesting. Last week, somebody asked me, who is the Vernon Jordan of the Latino community that plays the inside game, that can meet with worldwide leaders, Fortune 100 CEOs, and have a conversation where they're listened to? And I said, there's only one person in America who's Latino that you could name, and that's Saul Trujillo. Saul has a, a unique point of view. He will see opportunity where most people can't see it. And then he will take the opportunity and he will drive it to conclusion. I think Saul will always be remembered for his achievements in the telecommunication industry, but much more so, he's a community leader who deeply believes in what he's doing. Saul's a leader in business, but he's also a leader in his community. And he does a huge amount of work advocating for people, advocating for organisations and groups. And he's extremely effective at it. He works extensively across the Hispanic community, he works in his local community, and he's incredibly kind about supporting people who are on their own journey. He's the only CEO I have ever seen who can innovate just as effectively in a massive corporation to in a startup. And he loves them both just as much. Saul is all about results, about winning and about innovation. And you know, people look at the iPhone. Well, you know, four years before the iPhone came out, Saul had already something better than the iPhone in Australia. He's innovated everywhere that he goes. And as the chairman of our company, even though he knew the answer, he wouldn't tell me what the answer was. He'd ask questions. He would guide, he would mentor. Always, always helpful. Personally, he has mentored me um, for a very long time. He has been my CEO. He is now the chairman of my company. He is the only leader I have ever seen of a very large corporation who can harness the values and the people and get them to rise to levels that they've never even considered before. Saul's living legacy is that he's taken individuals like myself, hundreds of them, and he tries to make them better leaders. He empowers them as men and women of character for America, not for the Latino community, for America. So congratulations, Saul, on a most deserved tribute. So it's a real pleasure to uh, have Saul with us today, and this is you know, a room full of thousands of students, and I wanted to start with this question. You grew up very, very poor. You met Corrine in, I guess, Wyoming. You went to the university in Laramie. If you woke up tomorrow, in your bed, back in school, 
20 years old, but you knew everything you know today, what would you do differently in a school now that has 160 different curriculums you could choose from? Wow, what a question. <laughs> you know, the, uh, I've been very fortunate to have the career that I've had, but at the same time, your, your, your question is like perfect. And the perfect element to it is, how would you optimize? Because in business, I don't care what company you're in, what industry you're in, what My job you're in, optimization and maximization are always principles. So your question is, is what would I have, what could have helped me be better? And would have you done anything different? And, and I would start first by saying, I grew up in an era where I was basically the first. The first Latino, and those of you that might have ever seen any pictures of me when I was in my early stage of my career, in my middle management stage, you would have seen me con cabello, you know, the, <laughs> the hair that was, you know, of the time, and one point in time I had a beard, I had, you know, I've always had a mustache, I think. Uh, I've, I've been different. I was never a conformist and almost to the point where I was a maverick nonconformist. So the answer is basically, if I would have had a mentor, I think many of my paths would have been even better with less, let's call it tension, and, and I could have talked through some things and people could have taken me aside and, and coached me on some of the things that I, I could have done differently. And so in the case of the, the business side, you know, what else could I have done? What could I have done better? I think the one thing that I learned in life, I learned it early, but you have to keep on reminding yourself in business. And somebody, I'm going to simplify it. Somebody once told me, they said, Saul, just remember, you have two of these, you have two of these, and you have one of these. Use them in proportion. And how helpful has, you, you stayed there and got an MBA as well. Would you do that again? How helpful was that? Absolutely. The, the story is that my wife and I, my wife Corinne and I, we got married when I was a senior getting my business degree. She was a junior and we wanted her to finish her, to get her degree. So I had a choice of going to work at that point in time for the Bank of Laramie. And I could have been a VP of you know this bank, this small bank there. And I looked at that and I had a choice of trying to get an MBA mm -hmm. or working in the bank and so that my wife could finish her, her degree. And so I made a decision that said I would get, go for an MBA, but I could only afford to do it in one year. Wow. And, and you know, because I was already working three jobs and all that sort of thing. And so I had to petition to the university president and had to get certain scores on tests and all that. And so I was the first person to ever essentially get an MBA in two semesters while writing my thesis, while working three jobs, while being married, while doing all the things that some of us grow up learning how to do. But the MBA decision was one of the best decisions I made because when I was getting it, I was taking classes, like many of you have, you know, when you take calculus and you're taking these, you're going through differential equations and you're trying to figure out, how would I ever use this? Where would I ever use it? Because growing up, you know, when we were sitting at our dinner table, you know, eating our papitas y frijoles y tortillas, you know, we weren't talking about the economy, right. we weren't talking about a lot of things, so now this thing called differential equations is happening. But well, what I learned with that is basically almost everything you learn in school you can use in the marketplace. And I was using differential equations literally in the first job I had because I was innovating around how we thought about pricing, how we thought about demand, how we correlated variables, etc. Yeah. So long story short, the MBA was great for me because all the stuff I never thought I could use all of a sudden came out when I was faced with real world problems. So, so, so these guys are like, a lot of them are like, oh, I'm going to graduate, but now I got to go get an MBA too. But it's all right. What? <laughs> You're never done with learning. But so can, I, can I say one more thing, yeah. though, on the MBA? The reason why it was so important 
is that the difference between undergraduate and graduate school to me was under undergraduate, you're learning, you're absorbing, you're memorizing, you're, you're, you're storing and filing in your computer here what it is that you're, you know, whatever your major is. When you go for an MBA, you have to put it to work. You learn how to think. You learn how to prioritize. You learn, and in an MBA class like the one I had, there were only 15 of us, so it was highly competitive. Highly competitive in terms of, you know, even who went to the library first to check out the right books so that you could pre prevent somebody right. else from, from getting the books just to write a thesis or, or a paper. How do you help, you know, a lot of our students are going to community colleges, they're going to small universities, and they're coming into, you know, top 100 companies that are here today, and when they go for that internship or that first job, everyone they meet in the hallway went to Harvard or Yale or Princeton, how, how do you deal with, with that? Uh, again, real life experience. I grew up, I started in what was called the AT&T Bell System. Now for some of you out there, you wouldn't even relate to it, but back in the mid 70s and uh, well into the 80s, it was the largest company in the world, the single largest company in the world, and it was the largest employer. And so I started in that system and basically, if you wanted to get to middle management, you had to perform, but you had to go through assessments. And in these assessment sessions, they'd bring in the kind of the best and brightest, and most of the time there were people from Harvard, Yale, Stanford, you know, the London School of Economics, whatever, and I'm there with my pedigree called the University of Wyoming. And the good news was, I didn't know much better to think that they were that much better than the University of Wyoming because I didn't even know about Harvard and Stanford. When I was graduating from high school, nobody ever talked to me about going somewhere like that school you know, and having that opportunity. So for me, I never paid attention to it till I was later in my career, where as you performed, you had to take an assessment test, which was like publish or perish in, in professorship, right. where if you passed the assessment, you could go on to be an officer and if you didn't pass, they encouraged you to go look for another job in another company. <laughs> and so for me, again, it was almost no risk because I had already gotten my confidence, and this is really important, through experience, through doing the hard work, through doing, in many cases, the jobs that other people didn't want to do, or doing things harder and longer than other, people's would do, other people would do, is that I developed my own set of confidences around topics, around problem solving, around a lot of things. So when I went through that, it was, a, it was a session that was 20 people, the best people from probably 200,000 people in the company in an age group, and it was publisher Paris. So think about that pressure. Literally, the, of the 20 people that week, it was a week-long assessment, that week there were two people that had nervous breakdowns. It was so stressful and other people that just kind of, they wilted under the pressure, and at the same time, they were looking for people to, to emerge as leaders. And for me, I, you know, again, I, I didn't know better. I didn't know the protocols right. and all that. So long story short, that, that ability to not think about pedigree as an advantage or disadvantage, but what you do as the advantage maker and really want, was important. And I want to shift now to mentoring. So you've mentored me. You've mentored Oscar Munoz, who was here last year. Now he's a Fortune 100 CEO. And you agreed to mentor a young, one of the youngest VPs of J.P. Morgan Chase. You mentor so many people. Why do you do that? And why is, is this important for students to find mentors? Well, let me, let me start before I answer that question. There's another saying that that I've, I've learned to appreciate in life. Some of the smartest people I know are the people that know how to ask for help. And some of the dumbest people I know are the people who refuse help. Because as we go through life, none of us are so brilliant and so great and so talented that at different points in time, we need to know how to take advantage of those opportunities for somebody to help us and accelerate us 
smooth the path or whatever it might be. So mentorship to me became important because I didn't have one. During the era that I was, I mean, I was like the only person. I looked different, acted different, you know, didn't know the protocols, didn't know all the proper things you're supposed to do. You know, the first major dinner that I had with executives, there's all these forks and knives and spoons and, and other things, and I didn't know what you do with them. And people paid attention to how I looked at that. The first time I was served lobster in a shell, I tried cutting the, the shell with my knife and fork <laughs> because I didn't know, right. right? But when you have mentors taking it into a more practical side is that people can help you think through things. It's not that people are going to tell you what to do. It's not that people are going to decide for you. But it's people that can ask you questions, people that can help you think through your next steps, doing, doing your own career planning. There's a young, talented individual, I won't name him, but I sat down with him about five years ago about his career, and he works in one of the big companies in New York, and I said, so what do you want to be? You know, where do you want to go in this company? He said, geez, I'd like to get to the top of my, you know, my group. And I looked at him, and I looked at him, and I said, are you sure? And he, he got nervous and he looked at me and he said, well, why are you asking? I said, because you're bright, you're talented, you're a great communicator, you have charisma. So why aren't you thinking about being the CEO of your company? And he looked at me and he said, because I don't know. <laughs> And I said, look, you know, I know a lot of CEOs around the world because I've competed around the world. And I tell you what, it's always a function of your drive, your energy, to some extent your intellect. It's how well you network, how well you can lead people. And anybody can develop those skills and how competitive you are. And if you have those, which I think you do, you should now start thinking about how you make your career path work for you and find the people within your company that might be a mentor. I will be glad to mentor you in terms of somebody as that. But at, Charlie, the answer, I know I've made it too long, but the answer is simply that we can all take advantage of a mentor and somebody that can help make it, even if it's one step easier, or one step, half a step better in terms of thought, right. it's important. Yeah, and my abuelito used to say in Panama, when you learn to shave, try to learn to shave on someone else's face first. <laughs> and that's the power of a mentor. And Saul, Saul and I were business partners, and he's mentored me for a long time, and he's always said in companies, he has to repeat things five times before it actually sinks in. So I'm gonna play a little video on a mentoring platform and a leadership certification platform that I've mentioned only four times, and only 86 people have signed up, believe it or not. But can you play the video, please? This will be the fourth time. Thank you. My purpose is to inspire and connect others to achieve extraordinary things. That's why I'm at Alpha as CEO. One of our values is to be boldly innovative. And today we're bringing to you, with our two strategic partners, a bold, innovative program. One of our partners is Juby. What Juby has created for Alpha is a program where we can certify your leadership skills. Learn, do, inspire, and have someone else verify that you've done those skills. The first two programs of many to be developed, not only by us, but by our corporate partners, is called Lead to Inspire. Lead to Inspire is how you can exercise your influence to engage others to achieve extraordinary things in your leadership. The second program is Habitudes. Habitudes are the habits of leadership that you need yourself to be a great leader. But all of this also works with our partner, Kubera. Kubera has designed for Alpha a mentorship platform. Mentoring 
Not only if you're a student being mentored by a professional or a young professional being mentored by a senior, but a senior professional that wants to get on a Fortune 500 board and needs a mentor. We'll have hundreds of Latino mentors that are on Fortune 500 boards to help. All you have to do is go to alpha.org slash empower, tell us you're interested, and we'll send you a link in the next 30 days when we're up and running. Do not fail to go to alpha.org slash empower. You know that joke about don't clap, send money? Everybody has a phone. I never thought I'd ever do this. I want you all to take out your phone. Take out your phone. I know you've been texting this whole time anyways. <laughs> and on that phone, go to your Alpha app. And when you go to the menu, go to announcement. And on the announcement, the first thing that's going to pop up is a mentor and a link. Go to the link. I just hit it. It opens to a page where you can input your name, your phone number, your email, to be a mentor, to be a mentee, to sign up for the Girl Scouts or Junior Achievement, and we will email you back. And I'm, I, at the end of this, I'm going to see if it goes from 86 to 2,000, and it better. <laughs> so back to you, Saul. Um, I had a group of students I was talking to today, and we were talking about the value of excellent and being extraordinary. And she says, how do I reconcile my value of being humble and humilde with being extraordinary? And was really struggling with that. How, how do you answer that? It's really an important question that I would say that depending upon what part of my career, I would say I wasn't very good at it. <clears throat> Early in my career, I used to think, believe it or not, that I was smarter, better than anybody else, and I could do things myself, and I could just drive, drive through everything. And you find out that maybe you could, but that's a rough way to do things. And you want people with you, you don't want people against you. And, and so when you think about motivating not only yourself but others, it's about how you share success and when things don't go right, how you take responsibility for it um, yourself. And so, you, you know, humility shows up in a lot of ways. Some people think it's always about being quiet and retiring and, and that sort of thing. But humility can be always about your teams, your people, your coworkers, your your company or whatever, and never, you know, spending too much time on the I and, side. And what about the opposite? Because a lot of the Americans, particularly that go to prep schools and all these Ivy League schools, they, they have so much confidence and they just jump out there. And a lot of the Latinos feel that they, they need to be more humble than to stand out. And that not standing out holds them back from opportunities. Yeah, I think there's a difference between humility, and, and you can be you know, humble, but you can also be assertive. And, and I think that you know, people follow people that have ideas, people that include people in terms of the generation of ideas, that include them in terms of the execution of ideas, and then include them when the kudos, you know, the, the results are in and things are good, and you're basically attributing it. But you can be as assertive as, as, you, as anybody by taking charge on being decisive, you know, being um, uh, innovative and creative and entrepreneurial. Because the, the, the key part of getting results is always, I think there's a high correlation between decisiveness and you know, the cycle time to dis being decisive and results. Those people who linger too long, who let things fester, and especially in a digital era, it makes a huge difference in terms of speed of movement. And alignment of movement then becomes critical in small organizations or large organizations. And so it's that part that you want people to follow you and go with you and buy into right. you, et cetera. 
And it's the other part that says the humility comes with recognizing people, respecting people, using the two eyes, the two ears, and then ultimately recognizing people when it's done. Right. P part of everyone's human capital is their ability to authentically connect with others and build powerful networks. Today, you can meet with presidents. I've seen you raise the phone and raise a million for Stanford by calling a Fortune 10 CEO. But going back to the beginning of your career, what advice do you give uh, young professionals to develop that muscle of connecting authentically with others and building these powerful networks that can help them in their career? Well, again, I think you know, some, a lot of times it's very personal, right? What is your passion? And so, in my case, I have a very strong passion about my country. I have a very strong passion about my family. I have a very strong passion about technology and the, and the industry that I've worked in. Let's not forget tennis. And, and I do have a passion about certain sports, actually all sports, but those that I can play, uh, you know, at, given the career that I pursued. But, but the point is, is that, you know, you, you emanate through your passion to others the kind of commitment, the kind of support, the kind of, you know, you never give up kind of essence. I think that that's very important for people to see. If you're half-hearted about anything, if you're not fully committed with most things, People are always reserved because they don't want to get burned. They don't want to get caught in a bad situation. They don't want to get caught in failure. They don't want to get caught in a lot of things. So, you know, the, this notion of passion, which is what Latinos do have as a DNA element, uh, I think is very important. But it emanates throughout all that you do and how you think and how mm -hmm. intense you are and, and that sort of thing. But also, as I saw last night, with those of you that were dressed in white, it's also the fun side of it and how, uh, how well you can take advantage of that as well. I have a question on a lot of Latinos reach positions of power, whether it's Fortune 500 boards or CEOs, and really do nothing for the community. You've reached the very tippy tippy heights of so many things, yet, you could be comfortably doing something else, but you're dedicated to this community. Why are you doing that? What, what drives you to, to, to do what you do? Well, I, I can say it very simply, and it may sound corny to some people, but it's for love of country, and it's for love of my community. I mean, I grew up in a, in a world where, you know, my parents got married at 16 and 14, they didn't have any, 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 anything. And so, you know, we had to make our way. And I saw their struggles, you know, that they had and the commitment that they had to me as, as a son and the fact that, you know, my father never went to school, but he always talked about I was going to go to college and be the first one. And I've seen other people, you know, struggle that were in similar situations. And I've seen the sincerity, the passion, etc. The good news is that now in today's economic environment, actually the last 20 years, and for the next probably 30, 40, or 50, our economy in our country is dramatically dependent on the success of Latinos. And so because I have a passion about being a Latino, my name has always been Trujillo, not Trujillo, not to, you know, uh, other ways that people sometimes try to affinitize themselves with with other people, even in Australia, it was Trujillo. Uh, and, you know, it became uh, problematic at times. But the point is, is that if you have that passion about who you are, it can help affect the future of somebody else. And we always have to give back. You know, my view is, is that those of us that are fortunate, like all of you here, because you've already reached a level of success, whether you're a student, and getting the kind of education you're getting today, whether you're a young professional and starting in your career because you've already gone through the educational stage and now you're in that professional growth stage, or those of you that have reached higher levels within your company, we're all fortunate. And we have to help others 
because we can help our community. And while we help our community, we're helping our country. And the last point that I'd make on that is that I have competed on every continent minus one in the world. And I know what's happening in China. I know what's happening in India. I know what's happening in other parts of the world. And we're in a competitive battle. That's what globalization is about. And for those of you that work in companies or have led companies, how close you are, how aligned you are, you can generally predict how successful you're going to be. How divided you are, how unaligned you are, those are the companies that generally tend to have problems because there's not clarity. Mm -hmm. And in this case, as a nation, we've got to rally around the growth variable in our economy, which are the new mainstream, what I call the new mainstream. And it defines who we are as a nation. And that's part of the opportunity for everybody in this room and all the people that aren't in the room as we educate. While I ask Saul this question, I want students that would like to ask Saul a question to line up at the microphones and uh, you guys can ask the rest of the questions so he can see what's on your mind. Uh, I was struck today talking to students that two of the young students one was a mother and one was a father. I've met, you know, Corrine is an amazing woman that's been at your side for many years, and you have three great successful daughters. And I always look at individuals and look at their family. What advice do you have for men and women in this room that are parents or will be parents soon in terms of how to pick well and how to raise good, successful kids with a social conscience? Boy, I wish that was, you know, one, two, three. I, I, I would say, first of all, in my case, I married well. I married well above me. Not economically speaking. My wife was, you know, when we talk about, we always joke in our family when we have family get-togethers, who was poorer <laughs> when we were growing up? And she reached the point where, because she, Unfortunately, she had a father that abandoned the family. She always used to say, well, we were so poor that we couldn't afford a father. <laughs> <laughs> but, but when I say that, I say that with much love because my wife is, you know, she's just priceless in, to me and to my children because she was always there. She's very kind, very supporting. She loves you know, she loves people, she loves family, she loves almost everything. And to bear with me personally uh, for all the years, uh, you know, it's, it's been tough because in my career, I started out relatively successful at a very young age. In my case, you know, Charlie may have said this in the introduction, but in the largest company in the world, I became the youngest offer, officer ever in their history at the age of 32, where, where now all of a sudden I was sitting next to people that were 25 years, 30 years older than me, and sitting at the same table, which meant that I now had to lead a different life. You're always gone. You're always traveling. And we had <coughs> three young daughters. We couldn't have children initially, but then we had three young daughters in a row. And so my wife was stuck with basically raising them with occasional appearance, guest appearances from their father. And, and so the tension that, that is in a circumstance like that is unusual. So I would say in, in you know, you've met Corrine. I mean, she's, she's the strongest woman I know uh, because she's so good about everybody else and kind of selfless. So I say, I married above my pay grade for sure. And, uh, and then it's about values. And Corrine has great values. I try to have great values. And you, you make sure with your children while you're working that you have to balance that conversation with them about sometimes it's do as I say, not as I'm doing right now. But in the aggregate, it will be as I do. Because, you know, we can't be perfect. And when people talk about balance, work, you know, work-life balance, I can tell you I've not met a person that rose to the top of anything that had that perfect balance. You make trade-offs on occasion. 
But over time, your value system should never change. Great. Well, we're going to open it up to the students. I'm kind of blinded by the light, so I can't see any of them. I hope somebody's lined up. And go ahead and ask a question. Anybody lined up? If not, I have Saul all to myself. But this is part of that confident humility. Students on table one, alpha one. There you go. Hi. My name is Flor Morales. I'm the okay. president of the UT Dallas chapter here. And one of the questions I had for Seoul was earlier you mentioned a little bit of tension when you had your beard and the big hair. But how were you promoted? How did you overcome those tensions to get where you are now? That's a great question. And I, I, I struggled with this throughout my career because I was never if you go to any company that I've ever been at and you talk to people in our industry, I've been always known as a maverick. Somebody that you know, doesn't just do things like everybody else. So the one rule of, of life that I learned in business was that performance, getting results, speaks much louder than almost everything else. Now, there's times early in your career where you're establishing a reputation and you haven't had chance to have multiple jobs where you've performed very well and all that. But, but it's trying to stay focused on how you perform, the results that you get. And as I said earlier, not just the results that you're getting, meaning you, I, but how you're helping your group, your work group, your boss, your, your boss's boss, and all of them have great results and building it as a team in terms of what you do. But I will always say, Getting great results works eight and a half times out of 10. <laughs> and notice I don't say 10 times out of 10, because sometimes other stuff happens. We'll go to the front and then back to the back. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, so thank you so much for your time. Uh, my question is, how do you, especially a lot of us are coming out of college into you know, our, our first job, and many times um, our first full-time offer, you know, trying to figure things out, how do you what would you say to us um, in terms of building our confidence early on so that we can kind of, you know, not limit ourselves to the opportunities out there? Well, you know, the, the, again, another great question in the sense that uh, here, here's what I did when I first started. Because, again, like m maybe many of you in the room, I hadn't, my, my parents weren't in business. I didn't know anything about business. So I didn't know protocols. I didn't know a lot of things. But one thing I always learned in life, because I've been working since I was eight and all that, you always, you're, you know, you're always studying other people and what they do and what they do well and what they don't do well. But in the job, the first jobs that I had, I always used to sit down with my boss and say, so tell me what you expect of me and tell me what you think would be a good job. Tell me what you think would be a great job. Tell me what you think would be a bad job. And then I now have kind of a playing field outlined hmm. for me. Great advice. And then when I knew what was the best job that somebody had ever done or they thought would be a great job, I personally set my own markers way beyond that in terms of performance. And that way I knew I had already socialized with my boss, my boss telling me what were the, you know, the ground rules, how they would keep score, and what they thought would be a winning score then I knew that if I scored more than that, that I would always then be into the realm of promotable, into the realm of getting that next opportunity, which may not be a promotion, but may be more experience. And so the confidence that comes with definition, knowing whether you're playing baseball or cricket, because they both have a ball and a bat, but much different rules depending upon which game they are. And that's really important, I think, to anybody. And as I've mentored people in companies that work for me, I always tell them, make sure that you understand performance speaks louder than anything else. How you create and deliver that performance speaks almost as loud. And then all the other stuff is you know, stuff that you can always polish up. Because like a guy like me, even though I was trying to cut a lobster uh, shell with a knife and a fork, I could learn that stuff. 
But what you can't learn is that, that passion about results, how you, you know, the quality of the results, and how you do it, you know, within the context of a team. Great. Go on to the back now. Good afternoon. My name is Lazaro Torres from Florida International University. And my question is, do you recommend getting an MBA right after college or later in your, in your career? You know, that, that's a question that sometimes gets defined by personal circumstance. I think most people would say it's helpful that if you worked a few years and then went back to get an MBA, you know, it works better for you because you know how to appreciate better the things that you're going to learn in graduate school. I would say that that's true, and I would also say that sometimes if you're, if you're really driven and you're there about absorbing as much as you can and learning as much as you can, sometimes it's, it's better not to lose momentum by going off and getting a degree after you've got a few years under your belt. Because in a digital world, I'm, I may be committing heresy in the eyes of a lot of educators and others, but in the digital world, everything's moving so fast that if you move out for a year or two, you may be out of date when you come back, even though you went for an educational enhancement. And so the question is, is it depends on the circumstance. If the company's really behind it and they're gonna hold a slot for you or there's something there for you, great. And if you can find a way to get a, an MBA while you're working and doing that sort of thing, which a lot of people in, in my era, we did, um, you know, you, you can do it that way, or you can do it, you know, essentially uh, get it straight out of school if you can afford the time and the money. And again, it's, it's all a personal choice. Great. To the front. It's such an honor to speak with you, both, C both CEOs. And one of the questions that I had is that throughout my life, I lived through a simple quote that has helped me wherever I go which is, winners make commitments, losers make excuses, spoken by former Atlanta Braves general manager John Sherholtz. <laughs> but I guess my question to you is, what is the life quote that you've used through your successes, through your failures, through everything that you've gone through? Well, I would say it's part of the answer I gave earlier, which is the, the fact that, number one, performance matters more than anything else. If you want to look at a rule of thumb, and you're going to do a regression analysis of your success if rising within a company or an industry is your measure, because not everybody has that as a measure, but if that's it, the R squared there on performance is relatively higher than anything else. The second part, though, is that if you become a leader, leading by example, where no one can look at you and say, you're being asked, you're asking them to do something that you personally wouldn't do. That's another mantra that I've always felt. And I can tell you, if you surveyed anybody that's worked in one company of 80,000 or another company of 50,000 or another company of 70,000, no one would ever be able to say that I asked people to do something I personally wouldn't do. And that was one of the benefits of growing up the way I did, because you name the job, I've done it. And, uh, and so I appreciate everything that, that exists within a company and the jobs that people have. But to, to give you some insight, when I went to Saul's house the first time and we went to kind of negotiate, I knew I was in trouble, but I actually liked it because I looked up in his den and there was this big picture of General uh, uh, Patton. The only general the Germans were afraid of in World War II because not only did he perform, but the way he measured his success was how many men or women he lost in battle and everybody wanted to work for him. So I knew this is someone all about performance. Uh, going to the back now. Good afternoon, my name is Jeffrey Cole. I'm a rising senior at Baruch College. The question I wanted to ask you is, what skills should an aspiring executive look to develop early on in their career? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's become very evident to most people, uh, and that is that you have to be very, very digitally centric in almost everything that you do. 
So being, you know, we've gone through eras in my lifetime, in my career, where you have kind of the techno technologically proficient and then those that are technophobes. And that was the way people got described. Now it's like breathing air. It's like being able to walk. You know, you have to understand how to leverage the technologies that exist, whether it be, you know, embedded in software in a device or the devices themselves, or how you connect, how you communicate. And now as we evolve over the next probably five years, we're going to see heavy proliferation of virtual reality. And that becomes a tool in marketing. It becomes a tool in medicine. It becomes a tool in education. It becomes a tool in gaming. It becomes a tool in a lot of things. Then we're going to also step into this notion of artificial intelligence. And, and how do you leverage that when you think about big data and all the data that we've been storing and all the analytics that we've had in our businesses and so we're going to have some massive transformation coming. Being comfortable, studying it, reading it, being able to leverage it is critical in almost any job, whether you're in the financial field, the operating field, uh, a consulting field, whatever it might be, I can tell you that you cannot perform going forward unless you know how to leverage that, that kind of environment. Next question. Uh, Mr. Trujillo, Mr. Garcia, how are you? I am Bernardo Garrati. I am a rising sophomore at Drexel University, and this is my first Alpha convention. Um, I moved from Venezuela around three years ago, and I am having a little bit of trouble of breaking that um, stereotype that Latino immigrants have um, in, in the United States. What advice can you give me and the other thousands and millions of Latino immigrants that are moving to a stage for better opportunities, but don't want to lose their essence and their Latino spice. Can you, can you just say, sorry, can you just say a little bit more about what you've been running into? Give us an example or two. Um, I don't want to get political. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, um, no. If, if you want me to go more in detail, I, I moved to, with my mom and my sister, to a, a very small town in New Jersey, um, Malvar, I don't know how many people have heard of it, it's not that far away from, from the city of New York, and most of the kids there are, um, have been there, their families have been there for years, they're mostly um, white. I was the first international student in a school that has been there for 70 years. And you'll be surprised how many questions have been asked about whether or not we were shoes in Venezuela, if there was McDonald's in Venezuela, or if there were even computers in Venezuela. So those, and again, without getting too political, um, I don't think, you can see it in the media how Latinos are perceived, and I wanna, I wanna break that stereotype, and I wanna show that we're professional, that we're here for. Yeah. Well, you know, your, your, your question is, is kind of relevant to a lot of us uh, in different ways. But, but the punchline answer to your question is do what you need to do, what you want to do, and do it well. And people will see the outcomes that you generate <clears throat> as you perform, whether it be in your community, in your neighborhood, in school, or ultimately in the jobs that you have. I mean, performance is the great equalizer because you, you can't skew it that much unless you have somebody like maybe one of the political people that you know, doesn't understand a lot of things. But, and, and, I, and by the way, I am a Republican. So, so you know, I always look at facts and data. So I would just say that, that that's very important. I can tell you a quick story if Charlie lets me. When I went to Australia, to run the, the country's largest company. The day that it was announced, I had not been there, didn't know anybody. The day that it was announced in the Financial Review, which is like the Wall Street Journal of Australia, there was a headline that said, New Telstra Chief, and it had a caricature of a Mexicano on a burro, con un serape y sombrero, así. Right? And so there was a stereotype of this new CEO 
that was coming to the country. Now, my wife, who wasn't with me when I arrived there, and she saw it because she went online, and she saw this, she called me up that night and said, why are you doing this? Right? I had already turned them down two or three times, but they were persistent, and they really wanted me to go do a transformation and a privatization. So I told her that night, I said, now more than ever, I'm going to show everybody what somebody named Trujillo is capable of doing so that the stereotype... <laughs> So that the stereotype that people have will now change based upon what you do, not what somebody thinks that you're capable of doing. And I would say the same thing for any of us in the room. And that goes to anybody. We're going to have to cut the questions off there. I'm going to give the last word to Saul. Can you please answer the question that wasn't asked of you that you would have wanted asked and answered? Wow. Um, I'm not sure I would want it asked. <laughs> no, but, but I guess one of the questions that I get asked at my stage, because I've, as Charlie said, I've run three different, you know, $50 billion market cap companies. I've worked all over the world. I've done a lot of things. I've innovated, et cetera, et cetera. And people say to me today, so why are you still doing what you're doing and why are you still engaged in all that? And for me, business is a sport. And I love playing sports. And I love winning. And once upon a time, there was a basketball coach. Uh, he's still alive, and he still coaches. But I had come and talked to one of my large sales team or uh, meetings. And he had a saying. People asked him, well, gee, you're, you're a workaholic, aren't you? And is that how you get your results, because you're a workaholic? And he said, no, I'm, I like to think of myself differently. My vocation is my vacation. Mm. And so for me, I look at business. I think there's so many things that are yet to be done that somebody's got to do. When I think about my country and I think about all the things that we could be doing, growing, competing, making life better, depolarizing, the way our society is today. There's so many things. And then just in terms of my own personal family and, and things that I could be doing better as a father and as a husband and as a grandfather, who I'm now a grandfather. And, uh, and there's just so much more to life. And so the point is, is that there's always more. And if you've got that notion that there's always more whether it be in your job today or 10 years from now or 20 years from now or in your personal lives, to me that, that should be a driving motivation for how you get up every morning and think about what more can I do? So thank you. Thank you, thank you. Big hand for Saul, thank you very much.